Good morning. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Remember yesterday, as we were reading and discussing this book, which, by the way, the title of is The Global Vatican by former U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, Francis Rooney, a book that boasts that the papacy controls both foreign and domestic policy, not only for the United States, but for the whole world. In our discussion yesterday, we were talking about Pope John the Twenty-Third and some of his encyclicals. The one we talked about last was Pacem in Terrace, which means peace on earth. If you listen carefully to the broadcast yesterday, you, you could come to the conclusion that what Pacem in Terrace was, in reality, was a very flowery global ultimatum. A threat of global nuclear annihilation if the world and the kings of the world did not achieve the peace that the papacy wanted. Now remember, Communism was created by the Jesuits. It was first experimented with in the Paraguayan reductions in Paraguay. The Jesuits had enslaved the Indians, promising them their basic needs of life, food, water, and shelter, and health care, and religion. If the Guaranis would manufacture use their time in daily pursuit of work, manufacture goods that the Jesuits could sell to Europe and amass a fortune. And I understand there was even the, uh, the mining of gold and silver, which the Guaranis had no use for, <laughs> except to decorate their idols. And since Rome has the same passion, why the gold and the silver were hustled off to Rome and, and Europe for all the idolaters in Europe at incalculable uh, worth and wealth for the Jesuits. And once this society, this communistic society, was perfected, the Jesuits simply imported it to Russia. And Russia was prepared by the, the, the uh, communist but Jesuit trained Lenin, Trotsky, and you know, you all, you know all the names. And then Russia became known as godless in the world and a, and a, and a tremendous threat to quote-unquote Christianity. And so with the Hegelian dialectic of atheistic communism, Jesuit created, never mind, uh, please don't forget, and then Christian Europe, quote-unquote Christian Europe, there was this war. There was war, First World War and the Second World War, and we've talked about all the things that the papacy achieved through both of those wars. But now we're talking global <clears throat> nuclear annihilation. This, this red menace still exists. It's still godless and atheist. It's still a threat to, to uh, quote-unquote Christianity. But now the world has nukes. Pope John the Twenty Third took advantage of a situation that he and his church, the Je with the help of the Jesuits, created. And it comes down to this: we've suffered World War One, we've suffered World War Two, enter the nuclear age, and now we're talking global nuclear annihilation. And so the Pope now puts himself after convening Vatican Council II and getting the attention of the whole world and uniting the Protestants back to the Roman Catholic Church and then uniting with all the religions in the world, creating a global religion. Everybody in response to this 
this indescribable terror of nuclear annihilation. And America, the hierarchy of America, especially the Roman Catholic hierarchy, know what's going on. In the process of all this terror and threat of war, the papacy has gained global recognition. He's now fashioning a global church, and America's becoming more and more Catholic by the day. The Protestants have surrendered. The separated brethren are now, well, they're Christians, just like Catholics. There's no fear of the greatest of all evils to be feared in a nation, Roman Catholicism, as the Protestants believed during the colonial period. And Pachaman Terrace is the crowning glory of Pope John the Twenty Third, where he literally puts the world is at its knees. We need peace, a peace defined by the papacy, a peace that only the papacy can bring. And under this new peace, this new global government guaranteeing peace, the papacy now is going to be the well, the judge of all judges, and he's even going to be the judge and arbiter of uh, the natural law. Not just Roman Catholic canon law, but the natural law. And he's also going to be the God of every man's conscience. That's what is basically said in Pachem in Terrace. It's a global ultimatum. Now, of course, this author doesn't put it that way because that's not on his agenda. His agenda is to convince you that the world can't survive without this divinely or, or ordained institution of global government, the papacy. And that you ought to be a beneficiary and a participant, an obedient participant in this divinely inspired institution, this quote-unquote divinely inspired institution. <clears throat> you ought to be completely subject to the Roman pontiff. Even the natural law is to be determined by the Roman pontiff. Even your conscience is to be guided by the Roman pontiff, or there would be no peace on earth. Now, some people may find this a stretch, <laughs> but if you're following what this book is revealing, you can easily come to the conclusion that the papacy, if the world will not cooperate, if the kings and the governments of the world will not cooperate with the Pope's peace, then there will be global nuclear annihilation. The Pope's going to have it his way or the highway. Now, you think that's too far? Well, there was a time many, many millennia ago, well, not too many because the earth is only roughly 6,000 years old, so six millennium. But after the first millennium, our Bible describes a time when the, even the imaginations of a man's heart were only evil continually. And, he, and it grieved God at his spirit. And he said, the end of all flesh has come before me. And I'm going to destroy it with a flood. And I'm going to save a, a people through Noah to repopulate the earth. Global annihilation through a flood. Now, if the Pope, in his reasoning, is become the God of this earth, doesn't he also have that same prerogative? To destroy the earth with a flood, a nuclear flood? A flood of fire? Well, you can take that or leave it, but this encyclical, Pachamon Terrace, 
what it boils down to is a global ultimatum. Now you have to ask yourself, well, Tom, that would require that the papacy would have direct control of all the nuclear weapons in the world. Don't you know that they're all required to, to have launch codes? Special, digital, or other instruction and control? Who do you think writes those codes? Is it possible that the Jesuits write those codes? Is it possible that the Vatican writes those codes? Listen, <clears throat> if the Pope, and I assert that he is, that's not negotiable here at Inquisition Update, he is in control of the kings of the earth. We have a global threat of nuclear annihilation. We have many nations in the world now with nukes that have the capability of... of uh, <laughs> If not nuclear annihilation, certainly would make this a hell on earth. And if the, if the papacy in the New World Order is just as much in control of the kings of the earth as he was during the Old World Order and could order whole nations and leagues of nations in crusade after crusade, doesn't he still have the power to launch those nuclear weapons. And just to make sure that some king in some nation somewhere under the papacy's authority decides to take out his own vengeance somewhere else in the world without the Pope's permission, do you think the Pope would permit it if he had control? No. No. Just simply nullify the launch codes, disable the missiles. So any renegade president of the United States that decides maybe uh, the Vatican is the problem in the world, the cause and fomenter of all the wars, might turn those nukes on the Pope. So the Pope's got to have the key to the missiles. Think about it. Do you think the Pope, the, the God of this world, given the last 1,500 years of history with controversy between the papacy and the kings of the earth, some king and the earth not wanting to do what the Pope wanted him to do, and possibly even launch uh, you know, a, a war against a, a, a nation friendly to the papacy? You've got to have more control than that in this modern nuclear age. can't allow a renegade king who comes out from under the skirt of the whore of Rome and decides to do, uh, wage his own war, promote his own personal agenda with nuclear power. That's just not enough security for the papacy. Well, I mean, after all, we can't have the modern, the nuclear equivalent of a of a King Henry the, the, the Fourth, can we? So what if the Vatican, with the help of the Jesuits, creates these launch codes and issues them to the kings of the earth? And that unless they have these launch codes, the, or the current launch code, they can't launch their nuclear arsenals they can only launch those nuclear arsenals if the Pope gives them the launch codes and then sets the targets. Am, have I gone too far? Is this too much for most people? What, 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 what would happen if Russia, being an, an anti-Christian, a godless atheist society decided to launch its nuclear weapons against the quote-unquote Christian world headed up by the Pope. You know, if the Pope doesn't have the launch codes, certainly he could do that. But what if the Pope's got the launch codes for communist Russia just like it has the launch codes for democratic or republican 
America. <clears throat> Just a thought. But nonetheless, Patchum and Terrace, if read correctly, in the context of history and in the context of Bible prophecy, it is a global ultimatum. Submit to the government of the Pope or else. And that else is nuclear. What do you think about that? Do you think I've gone too far? <clears throat> do you think that, well, Tom, you painted a conspiracy that's virtually impossible to maintain in secrecy, global secrecy. But remember, they don't have to conspire. Satan is the inspiration of the man of sin, the son of the perdition, the little horn with eyes like eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great blasphemies against the Most High and controlling the kings of the earth. He's a spirit. A satanic spirit, one who dwells in the, in the hearts and minds of those who reject Christ and his kingdom and seek to overthrow his kingdom. He inspires them all. It's a counterfeit to the kingdom of Christ, where the spirit of Christ inspires each and every individual Christian, and they all function as a complete body, each having a different function, not having to conspire with anyone else in the body of Christ. The eye does not conspire with the foot, nor the knee with the elbow. They all are interconnected spiritually under one truth, each having their perfect individual function. Can't Satan counterfeit that? I mean, after all, we've been taught all of our lives that Satan is the counterfeit. Satan has no real power of his own. He has to counterfeit what God does. Isn't this a perfect counterfeit? Now, if that counterfeit has the quote-unquote power of God to destroy the world with a flood of fire, you would think that the head of that diabolical body called the papacy would have some veto power <laughs> when it comes to destroying this creation, one that was created by God, the creator, control of nuclear weapons that could be turned upon the head. The pontiff, he must have control of that power. Or else he could not bring the world to an ultimatum such as described in Patchum and Terrace. All right, if I've gone too far, you can write me and let me know. But those nuclear weapons must be under someone's strict control. And just promoting the thought that they might not be under strict control, that the nuclear weapons that are being devised in Iran might not be under strict control and might be used for purposes unsavory to the West, that is, Rome and London and Washington, D.C., well, then there must be something done about it. That's the situation we're in. You see, Pope can, the papacy and the governments of the world can turn on the terror and turn it off, just like the keys that launch the missiles. Turn it on, turn it off. Whenever the Pope wants more power, and whenever the Pope wants to convince the world once again that he's a man of peace, all he's got to do is turn on the terror 
and then be the man to walk up and turn off the terror. That's what he did during the, the administration of uh, President John Kennedy. Turned on the terror and then turned off the terror. Turned it on before Vatican Council II, turned it off after Vatican Council II and the Protestant surrender. And he can do it again if if Jerusalem becomes the apple of the Pope's eye, and I insist it always has, the greatest Zionist in the world is the papacy, he cannot foment, he cannot act out his Jesuit-inspired futurist fulfillment of Daniel chapter 9, verses 27, uh, 23 through 27, if he doesn't have complete and unfettered control of Jerusalem. Now to get complete and unfettered Jerusalem. He makes Jerusalem, well, the great concern of the world. And how does he do that? Well, with the Muslims. All the terror. All the killing. He stands back and calls for peace, and in the process of getting that peace, he gets more control. As a matter of fact, he now has complete control of Temple Mount, so he gets to determine what and what not takes place on Temple Mount from here on out. And he's also got a Vatican-like enclave within the old city of Jerusalem, where he is the sole jurisdiction of that particular space of land. That The stage is all set for his futurist, his phony futurist fulfillment of Daniel 9.27. You know, when the Antichrist comes and makes a peace treaty with the Jews and then after three and a half years breaks the treaty and causes the sacrifices and oblations to cease? If the Pope's going to dummy up and phony up what Jesus did 2,000 years ago, he's got to have control of Jerusalem. And the only way the man of peace can get control of the city of Jerusalem is if it's com entirely under threat of nuclear annihilation, either from Iran or the... Islamo-fascists uh, all surrounding all the Muslim nations surrounding Jerusalem. Jerusalem has become the stage for the final act of the Pope's Antichrist, Antichrist theater. And the stakes have been raised in nuclear power, and the Pope, if he can't fulfill at least convincingly his version of Daniel 9.27, turn the switch on launch the missiles. We're going to have a global flood. Even the imaginations of men's hearts are e only evil continually. They will not accept me. The world has rejected the papacy as the Christ, and we're going to, you know, with grief in his heart, destroy the whole world. Is that Going too far? Is Did I just go too far? What could possibly be in the man, the mind of a man, an institution that for 1,500 years has soaked the, wor the earth in the blood of the saints and presumed to be a god on earth and demanded that every man, woman, and child on the planet be subject to the Roman pontiff? and then foist upon the world a global ultimatum of nuclear annihilation. Just like Jesus when he destroyed the world with a flood. Maybe the Pope would love to exercise his own deluge. I know Satan would We'll be back right after this. Visit CrossTheBorder.org 
C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crosstheborder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast and the truth about God's chosen people and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crosstheborder.org. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. If you want to support Inquisition Update, please support First Amendment Radio, who sponsors the program. I take nothing for what I do here at Inquisition Update. I ask for nothing. What God gives me, I freely give. It's my service. I dedicate a great portion of each and every day in preparation and prayer to do what I do here, and I consider it a blessing and a privilege. Why should I take payment for that which I gladly do for free? But First Amendment Radio has to pay the bills. So, help Nicholas out, and now we'll get back to the book. The Global Vatican. That's the name of the book. The Global Vatican. A very carefully created title for this book. <clears throat> Patchum and Terrace has hit the world, spread like wildfire. Now, beginning in the fourth full paragraph on page 123, the author concludes this portion of the chapter by saying, Before April 1963, President Kennedy steadfastly avoiding giving any hint that he listened to the Pope. He was was living in a, a Protestant potential country. The Protestants don't want him listening to the Pope. They don't want a foreign potentate controlling the White House, especially if you regard that foreign potentate as the man of sin of the Bible, the Antichrist of the Bible, the little horn of Daniel, that which was prophesied to come right after the Caesars left the power vacuum in Rome and went to Constantinople. And that power vacuum was filled with the quote-unquote bishop of bishops, the quote-unquote vicar of Christ, the replacement of Christ on earth, who would deceive the whole world, who would rule over the kings of the earth, and who would curse and kill and torture and deceive God's people. They didn't want the Antichrist running the White House. And President Kennedy had to be very careful not to overtly let it out that the Pope meant anything to him in the government. 
But Patchum in Terrace, <clears throat> Patchum in Terrace, peace on earth, moved President John Kennedy to speak. Quote, as a Catholic, I'm proud of it, said Kennedy. As an American, I've learned from it, unquote. Now, if you take that statement in the context of what I outlined earlier in the program, that Patchum and Terrace, in fact, was a global ultimatum, Kennedy didn't tell the American people. He says, as a Catholic, I'm proud of it. As an American, I've learned from it. I wonder what Kennedy learned. I wish he was alive today to tell us candidly, if that's possible for a Roman Catholic, what he learned by Patchen and Terrace. Okay. Continuing, he says, John Kennedy and John the Twenty Third. And by the way, if you're following along, that's a that's a, a typo. It's not John the Twenty Second. He was long since dead, but before the before the uh, presidency of John Kennedy. John Kennedy and John the Twenty Third never met. The Pope died on June 3, 1963, after a long fight with stomach cancer. President Kennedy died the following November, killed by an assassin's bullet. And I could go into a big, long line why the papacy had to do him in. But I've already done that during this program, so I, won't has, I, will, I will just keep moving on. He said, these like-named leaders, John Kennedy and John the Twenty-Third, these like-named leaders served in their respective offices only briefly, but the world saw remarkable change in those years. Indeed, it did. Nowhere was the change more obvious than in the relationship between the United States and the Catholic Church. Let me read it again. Nowhere was the change in the pontificate of John the Twenty-Third and President John F. Kennedy, nowhere was the change more obvious than in the relationship between the United States and the Catholic Church. That's huge. You stop and think about it. America, if you think about it from a Protestant point of view, America finally discarded, <laughs> America finally discarded, threw it away in the trash can, the anti-Catholic prejudices that had infected it from the start. Where was the start? The colonial period. Twelve of the, you know, <laughs> Twelve of the thirteen colonies were Protestant. Only one was Roman Catholic, Maryland, and they weren't e Catholics weren't even allowed to practice their Catholicism. Catholicism was the greatest of all evils to be feared in a nation, and history has proven the colonists correct. But that quote-unquote anti-Catholic, which should read Protestant or Protestant prejudices that had infected the, the, the United States from the start, had been discarded. Did you know that during the pontificate of John the Twenty-Third and President John F. Kennedy, that Protestantism was discarded? It was. Right down the old trash bin. And that's why Washington is crawling with papists. From the White House to the Supreme Court to Congress, that's why the Pope is invited by Congress. That body that represents the people of the United States have invited the Pope. I mean, America's Catholic now. We've got our political spokesman in Washington, D.C., submitting a formal invitation for the man of sin, the son. You can't get any lower than the United States is today because Protestantism was thrown in the can. 
during the Kennedy administration and during the pontificate of ecumenical council, Vatican Council II, John the 23rd. I'm telling you from the portals of glory, from the throne of Almighty God, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. When Protestants gave up the protest, when Protestants no longer knew who the man of sin was, just ignorance from coast to coast and from border to border, spiritual ignorance, and preached from the Protestant pulpits a futurism that denies that the Pope is the Antichrist, that it's one single individual that doesn't arrive on the world's sin until just seven years before Christ returns, and we don't have to worry about him anyway because we're going to be raptured out. What a lie straight from the pits of hell preached from the Protestant pulpits all over this country for over 200 years. Slumber has completely destroyed this country. Ignorance. Soothsayers, smooth talkers. And when a prophet speaks up with the truth, they condemn him as a lunatic, an anti-Catholic bigot, somebody that's got a grudge, an ax to grind for the papacy. What nonsense. You better listen. You better stop listening to the soothsayers behind the pulpits in the Protestant churches. The United States stands on the brink of spiritual doom if they haven't fallen already. I'm not sure that the loudest voice in this country could undo the damage that futurism has done to the body of Christ. You see, futurism doesn't bother anybody else. It specifically targets Protestants. That was the, the bullseye of futurism, was Protestantism. And it hit the target right smack dab in the bull's eye. And I'm not sure it can survive. Too many people love the soothsayers. Too many people love to hear smooth things. It's the same old stuff, just different millennium. There's nothing smooth about the New World Order. There's nothing good to be said of the New World Order. If you know what the New World Order really is, the reestablishment of the Old World Order that existed before the Protestant Reformation. This author has said America finally discarded the anti-Catholic prejudices that had infected it from the start. You've been discarded. You no longer have a voice, you anti-Catholic protestant you. The world won't listen to you anymore. So you just as well shut up and not subject yourself to any persecution because if you open your mouth against the papacy, the global peacemaker, the one who is going to bring us a new world order, you're going to be persecuted. We're going to shut you up one way or another. Right or wrong, we're going to shut you up. And if we can't shut you up, until we can, we'll discredit you to the point where people would be ashamed or embarrassed to say they even know your name. And we're going to torment you every possible way we can. You're going to find it hard to keep a job. 
you're going to find it hard to deal with people and obtain the necessities of life. And if you don't shut up, when we go to this cashless society, when you've got no money in your pocket, and the banks, which are controlled by the government, which is controlled by the papacy, can just turn the key and shut off your account. You are out of money, buddy. Can't pay your taxes. So then the tax collector comes, puts an eviction notice on the door, and now you and your wife and your children are out on the foot, eating in the cornfields if you don't get caught. See how it works? Oh, the cashless society is going to be so convenient. Just swipe your card. But if somebody don't like you, somebody from Rome or somebody from Washington, they could just turn the key, shut it off. You got no gold, you got no silver, and if you do, you can't carry it on your back because you're not going to be living in your house anymore. And if you do dare to walk out of that house with gold and silver on your back, <laughs> it'd be like stealing from a you know a candy store. Knock you in the head and haul off your gold. <clears throat> How are you going to protect it? You going to carry a safe on your back? <laughs> you can't eat gold. Then you'd be crying for manna from on high, won't you? Well, the manna is in your Bible, and the manna describes the papacy as the Antichrist. He is the, one, he is the one who has enslaved you and made you literally his vassal and has control of every aspect of your life. And no more so than he does now in the New World Order and digital banking. Cashless society. Sounds so wonderful, doesn't it? <laughs> You're going to be cashless, all right. You see, they hid the truth even in the name. Cashless society. You don't go along with this new world order. Before there's global nuclear annihilation, there's going to be a cashless society for anybody that disobeys the papacy and the government that serves it. Cashless. The pockets in your denim jeans will be good for nothing but your hands. You won't have any money to put in them. Because money will be digital. That's what the papacy has in store for us. You want to know who to blame? I've been telling you. But these anti-Catholic, these Protestant prejudices that have infected this country from the beginning have been trash canned. Patchman Terrace was a victory for the papacy. And he wrote other encyclicals, too, literally detailing how this new world order will operate. We're going to talk about those as we continue. He says the church at last moved beyond the monarchical. <laughs> what have I been describing? A monarchical society, right? This author says the church, that is the Roman Catholic Church, at last moved beyond the monarchical anti-democratic the uh, uh, tendencies that had kept it from embracing the very high, uh, ra rather the very right, its history and theology. Let me read it again without stumbling, if I can. The Roman Catholic Church at last moved beyond the monarchical, anti-democratic tendencies that had kept it from embracing the very rights its history and theology supported. This author says the very history and the theology of the Roman Catholic Church supports the rights of human being. <laughs> then why was it they burnt God's people at the stake and stretched them on the rack and put hot pokers in their eyes and their ears and their unmentionables, stole their property and their children, raised them up Catholic, and used all the wealth of the quote-unquote heretics, the body of Christ, to enrich the church? and the state. <laughs> the Roman Catholic Church has always been monarchical, 
and anti-democratic. And they've used the democratic process in the United States to make America monarchical. And somebody doubted when I said that uh, the Jesuits were actually the ones who created democracy. It has a Roman Catholic end. At the end of the democratic and republican rainbow is the Holy Father and monarchy, global monarchy. He says, the church at last moved beyond the monarchical anti-democratic tendencies that had kept it from embracing the very rights its history and theology supported. You can't believe the brazen audacity to suggest that the history and the theology of Roman Catholicism embraces anything but monarchism and anti-democracy and anti-Protestantism. <clears throat> but that's what he's got here in print, so I read it what it says. The church at last moved beyond the monarchical, anti-democratic tendencies that had kept it from embracing the very rights its history and theology supported. For the first time, each was in a position, the United States and the papacy, to recognize what was best in the other. The papacy is going to recognize what's best in dem democratic America, and democratic America is going to recognize what is best in Roman Catholicism. That's what it said. The theology of Catholicism and the ideals of America were most brilliantly reconciled in the person and writings of a third man named John, Father John Courtney, uh, Father John Courtney Murray, S.J., Jesuit priest, the most influential American Catholic writer of his day. Murray, a Jesuit priest, was best known for his book, We Hold These Truths. Catholic Reflections on the American Pro Proposition, published on the eve of John F. Kennedy's pres presidency in 1960. Murray's argument that Catholic faith and American convictions were compatible put him on the December cover of Time Magazine. <clears throat> Time Magazine, championing a Jesuit priest, one who has literally is a, a, pro, a professed member of the organization, the Jesuit order, that has orchestrated all the wars, the First World War, the Second World War, the Cold War hoax, the threat of nuclear annihilation, have no doubt written Pachum in Terrace for the Pope. <laughs> and we've got a Jesuit priest in this country regarded as, uh, regarded by one of the most read public uh, rags in this country, the man of the hour, Jesuit priest. He says, within the church, Murray made his greatest mark in the waning days of Vatican Council II, during which he acted as a powerful, if somewhat controversial, voice of religious liberty. Yes, <laughs> religious liberty. Murray, Jesuit priest Murray, was part of a group of Americans who pressed church leaders to accept two documents that forever changed the Holy See's attitude toward other religions, other religious faiths. The first of these, Nostra Aetate, was promulgated in late October of 1965. This document explicitly acknowledged that non-Catholic religions, non-Catholic religions, both Christian and non-Christian, might contain truth and value in their worship of the divine. Okay? Non-Catholic religions, both Christian and non-Christian. Does that make sense to you? If you're a Bible reader? No. This only makes sense if you understand the, the Roman Catholic Church is not Christianity. Okay? It's not Christianity. It's the Church of Antichrist. It's the synagogue of Satan. And they're going to acknowledge that other, quote-unquote, 
religions, Christian and non-Christian, that is, Protestants and Buddhists, might con- their religions might also contain truth and value in their worship of the divine. Here's what he says, quote, The Catholic Church rejects nothing that is true and holy in these religions. She regards with sincere reverence those ways of conduct and of life, those precepts and teachings which, though differing in many aspects from the ones she holds and sets forth, that is, the Roman Catholic Church holds and sets forth, nonetheless often reflect a ray of that truth, capital T, which enlightens all men. This is Lucifer. Because the God of the Bible wrote the whole Bible, example after example after example after example, blessings on those who worshipped him and him only, and destruction for those who did not. But this Jesuit priest, speaking for the Roman Catholic Church, says, you're all welcome, all you (laughs) anti-Catholics, all you Buddhists and all you Shintos, and I can't name them all. All, every pagan religion in the world is welcome. Because you've got just, if if nothing more than just a ray of that truth which enlightens all men. If that isn't contrary to the Bible, I, this is exactly the kind of language you use to prove that the Roman Catholic Church is not a Christian religion. So stop calling it Christianity for Christ's sake. Stop linking Christ with Belial. Stop joining Christ with Antichrist. Do you see why the wrath of God is descending upon this country just like it descended upon Israel when they began to mix the holy with the profane? They made no distinction between the holy and the profane. That's what the new world order is all about. Roman Catholicism is not by any stretch of the imagination Christianity. I'll see you tomorrow.